The 92nd Street Y and Jewish Television Network present an evening of conversation and performance with legendary musical composer Stephen Sondheim. A multiple Tony Award winning composer, Mr. Sondheim has written music and lyrics for such hit plays as A Little Night Music, Sunday in the Park with George, Sweeney Todd, and A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Hosting this evening is Pulitzer Prize winning composer, writer, and commentator Ned Roram. Performing the music of Mr. Sondheim are Broadway actors and singers Liz Calloway and Jonathan DeKuchitz, with piano accompaniment by Paul Ford, under the musical direction of Paul Gemignani. And here now is Stephen Sondheim. Steve, you've heard all these questions before, but you've never heard them from me. <laughs> You'll turn 70 next week. I'm six and a half years older. That distance was wider 51 years ago when Oscar Hammerstein gave me the Gershwin Memorial Award for an overture that's never been heard since. <laughs> Hammerstein Hammerstein lived, as I recall, on East 65th. Third. Could, uh, what? 63rd. 63rd. Could you, as a teenager, have been present at that May Day? And could you tell us something about your relation to and, and uh, with him and what you learned from him? It was unlikely I was there. Uh, I was still in college, so uh, it's unlikely. I didn't hear about the Gershwin Award. What, is it still given? No, it was the, it was the, the, the Gershwin <laughs> It was a thing that uh, a composer every year for about 10 years would write a piece and he'd either win or he didn't, and I won. And Michel Piastro, remember him, mm, conducted sure. my piece. But beforehand, and it was Am Hammerstein as well as Avon Long, mm -hmm. uh, whom Hammerstein did an imitation of, I still remember, uh, uh, on the 63rd apartment, and I was very impressed. We had to meet there before going to the concert. But anyway, I was wondering that since you were raised in that milieu, if you could tell me and everybody else what, what you got, what was your relation to him and what did you learn from him? Well, as I'm sure everybody in the audience knows he was a surrogate father and mentor and teacher to me. Um, and essentially what I learned from him was the kind of songwriting that um, Rodgers and Hammerstein sort of uh, pioneered in. It's, it's a holdover from operetta in a way. Uh, but it's the idea of songs carrying the story forward as opposed to just decorating the, the show, which is essentially what songs did in the 20s and 30s. Although Hammerstein had also pioneered this uh, in a commercial field anyway with Showboat, which is probably the watershed show that, that, um, in which the songs are absolutely necessary to the story. You can take a lot of them out and still tell the story, but not all of them. And you can take some of the songs out of Oklahoma and still tell the story. But essentially, it was, story, it was song as part of story. And then also, he structured his songs as little stories with uh, actually more like sonata form, uh, with a, a statement and a development and recapitulation. And if you look at many of his lyrics, not all of them, um, you'll find that there's a line, that there's an emotional development and an emotional conclusion and uh, sometimes an, I well, not really ironic, but a slight uh, punctuation twist at the end, or, uh, an ending, so that the song has a real sense of having ended as opposed to just stopping. And it was that sort of thing that he taught me. He also, he was meticulous about um, inflection, about the way words sit on music and the way, if you're going to write a conversational song, it should sound like conversational, so, sound like conversation, and not have the wrong accent um, <laughs> on certain words, which um, most uh, lyricists of uh, his generation ignored. Not all of them, uh, but some of them were blatant. Uh, Lawrence Hart and Ira Gershwin, particularly, although Cole Porter had, uh, his inflections were, were generally pretty good. But uh, it was the kind of uh, lyric writing that um, Dorothy Fields and Frank Lesser were also 
uh, proponents of, which is the rise and fall of the language and how it sat on the music. If the song was to advance the plot, did you, with Hammerstein, have a plot that needed advancing? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, the first show I showed it was a school show when I was 15 years old, and it had a plot. It was about the school. It was about the faculty and the students. And, and though the story was, uh, you can well imagine, pretty silly, it still was a story. And he treated the songs seriously, as if the story were serious, so that uh, a character who felt a certain emotion at, in a scene and then sang a song that did not relate to that emotion, he would point it out and say, this does not follow. Why is this song here? Why did you write this song? It's either, either it's stating something that's already been stated or it's stating something that is no longer true for the character, etc., etc. Because songs also as expression of character is something that, that Hammerstein uh, uh, pioneered. Again, I say pioneer because I'm talking about the commercial theater. Uh, had, you written the, had you written the book as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, people always talk about Milton Babbitt as one of your mentors, but I've never been clear. Uh, I, everyone here knows that Milton Babbitt is the, what shall I say, the uh, most difficult composer of the 20th century. You talk about the music, not the men. Yeah. No, he as a man is not difficult. <laughs> he talks a lot and his sentences run on, but, uh, but he's charming. <laughs> And, but his music is pretty dense, it's not quite the word. It's, uh, it's complex, in, in, anyway. But I've never been clear about what you gleaned from him or what he gleaned from you, uh, and he was very proud of you as a student. I, I, uh, I got a, 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 a prize, a music prize, when I graduated from Williams, which gave me money for two years to study in New York, and I did, and I studied with Milton. Uh, uh, he taught at Princeton, but I wanted private lessons because I didn't want to take musicology, I just wanted <coughs> theory and composition, and that's exactly what he taught me. He taught me tonal music and long line composition, how to organize material so that, uh, to organize music so that it, uh, no matter how long it lasted, whether it was three and a half minutes worth of song or 45 minutes worth of symphony, how is music organized? What is the architecture of music? And um, as a matter of fact, I asked him, because uh, I, uh, I didn't know anything about atonal music, and I asked him to teach me some of that. He said, you haven't exhausted tonal resources for yourself, so there's no point in your learning atonal. He said, I got to atonal music because tonal music, uh, he didn't say bored, bored him, but that he had, he had exhausted his relationship to tonal music. And you also must know that he, he was a uh, would-be songwriter. And in fact, when I met him, he was writing a show for Mary Martin. At least he hoped it would be for Mary Martin. <laughs> How were the songs? They looked like songs. They sounded like songs. They weren't songs. <laughs> I mean, everything was right about them except them. Yep. <clears throat> uh, excuse me if I read these things, but my uh, but I have a neat mind and I can't improvise. Uh, I wrote. You and I both write songs. On the face of it, those songs are in the same language, tonal, melodic, prosthotically comprehensible. But there is a crucial difference. You're a Broadway baby, and I'm an effete snob. <laughs> Though sometimes you've been accused of elitism, while I've been accused of accessibility. The difference, of course, lies not in the quality, but in genre. Uh, for example, the difference, difference between a so-called art song and a so-called pop song, or between what ASCAP misnames serious and popular music, and their whole departments are divided, you, you get paid according to serious music. Um, or it, it, it's, it's, it's a difference between species, not aesthetic but practical, the kind of voice you're writing for, the composition itself, which is variable or invariable. The two genres, like church and state, have run parallel forever, and in Europe have sometimes merged, while today there is a new breed of crossover like Adam Gaitel or Ricky Gordon. But if, say, Eileen Farrell or Audra MacDonald can cut it both ways, Barbara Streisand or Madonna cannot. My songs are shaped on pre-existing texts, sometimes centuries old and a hundred lines long, with voice line and accompaniment unalterable. Your songs are shaped, I think, with text and tune simultaneously on a 32 bar layout with keys and scoring and even tempos that are alterable, right? 
Ned. <laughs> Which comes first, the music or the words? Well, let, let's... The 32-bar song, Ned, went out about the time you went to Paris. 32-bar <laughs> song is no longer the basis of musical theater thing. Also, you make mistake when you divide things into serious and pop. There's also I did, music. That's cut. Well, but you, you made the distinction between you and me, uh, and you referred to pop. Uh, I don't write pop. I write for musical theater. It's quite a different thing. It used to be that, indeed, the uh, musical theater was the source of popular music. It's no longer true. And that has freed many composers for the musical theater because they no longer feel that they have to have a song that can be sung by whoever the artists in the old days, like Bing Crosby or Frank Sinatra were. Nowadays, artists write their own songs for the most part, artists meaning singers. And so it's freed uh, 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 the composers for the musical theater so they don't have to write in the sort of standard forms that they used to. So the rigidity of the forms is no longer true. One last question before we, uh, which is this? Uh, what's the difference between Broadway and opera? Well, I've said it before and I'll say it to you and I've said it to you before also. Um, <laughs> what I was, actually what I was gonna do is I was gonna whip out a piece of paper for each of these questions and read my answers. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I decided to let the host have, have the, have the, uh, um, the, essentially the difference is in the expectation of the audience, I think. It's obviously, obviously there are differences in terms of the performers and, and how they approach the singing as, as an art form. But uh, primarily an opera is something done in an opera house in front of an opera audience. And uh, a, a show is something done in a, either a Broadway or off-Broadway theater, um, or whatever you want to call musical play, musical comedy, in front of that kind of audience. And I truly believe that when the medium and the telephone was done on Broadway, they were shows, and when they were done in an opera house, they were operas. Even though they were sung through, they were sung through shows. They also but, used the same cast. Yes, that's also Whereas, true. Whereas I think in your, to correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if Angela Lansbury is singing an aria, is not the same experience as, Ros did Rosalind Elias, mm -hmm. uh, it, who, has a, who has an opera voice, mm -hmm. so it's a completely different approach and mm -hmm. different experience for the listener as well as for the singer. Mm -hmm. I say, and, but apart from that, I was deliberately taking an example of one where the exact same animal is put into a different uh, milieu and, and it changes. I'm sure there's a, um, I, it seems to me that there's a philosophy that says, isn't it, isn't what, the, where, where the object changes in terms of, the, of how it's viewed? What, I, anyway, well, yeah, I'm getting like, incoherent. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, anyway, that's the, that's the point. It's how it's received by the audience that changes the whole color and it changes the relationship of the, of the performers on stage to the audience, which is the necessary part of a theater, theater experience. Also to the composer. So do you have any, do you, I can't imagine my music being in, interchangeable that way, but do you... Interchangeable meaning? In other words, I can't imagine an opera of mine being done on, on Broadway with... Broadway type voices, mm. and I'm not being uh, hoity-toity about Broadway o uh, voices, but there's a different, whole different psychology. Not to mention vocal mm. uh, production. Mm -hmm. Anyway, can you set the scene for silly people and for In Buddy's Eyes, which Jonathan DeCuchis and Liz Calloway will perform now with Paul Ford, okay. and we can talk more about okay. all this later. Um. <coughs> Um, Buddy's Eyes is a song sung by middle-aged lady, Sally, this is from Follies, and um, she is trying to convince the fellow she was in love with many, many years ago that she's happily married, and her husband's name is Buddy, and she lives in Phoenix, and she's trying to take a kind of offhand, sophisticated attitude and convince him, and maybe even herself, that uh, her marriage is wonderful and she's very much in love with her husband. Uh, and uh, in Buddy's Eyes, what's the other one? Silly People? Silly People. Silly people. Which comes first? Which one are they going to do first? Silly People first? Silly People okay. first. Silly People, which will be sung first, is a song cut from a little night music sung by uh, uh, a servant uh, in the piece named Frid, who is the uh, 
sort of for the night boyfriend of Petra the maid. And Frid and Petra are out uh, on the lawns uh, or uh, in the field making love. And uh, Frid is commenting on the kind of um, uh, effete uh, uh, sort of flirtation flirtations that are going on in the main house in which everybody really wants to have sex with everybody else, but they're doing it through conversation and, uh, <laughs> and dinner as opposed to doing it. And he sings a song about how they're wasting their time. Do I say that Paul Ford is playing the piano? Paul Ford? I don't get older 
birds flying and I'm so lucky I feel like crying and in Paris wonderful to hear good diction. <laughs> uh, Something that does not occur in opera very often. Well, <laughs> because, because all they're interested in is vowel sounds. Mm -hmm. they, they, they they, they, they'd be very happy if there also, were no consonants. But in opera, people are singing more out of their spoken tessitura. Nevertheless, it's about, it's about the elegance of diction and you also precision. You also something that interested me, because Virgil Thompson, who thought of himself as the authority on prosody, mm. you rhyme flowers with ours. Mm -hmm. And Virgil would say, flower is a one-syllable word, therefore it rhymes with our. No, and instead, flower, flowers, too. And fl uh, but he said flower is a one-syllable word, it rhymes really? with our, and you've made our into a two-syllable word, so it rhymes with flower. No, usually, usually the... Uh, the uh, our, you said. I understand, but usually the, uh, uh, the um, what shall I say, the, uh, uh, the academic view of that is that flower is two syllables and our is one. And they would say, therefore, they don't, they don't rhyme, that OU is being a diphthong is one sound where flower is two. That would be the argument. I've heard that argument. Except another argument is that Shakespeare used flower as a single syllable. Not that he's always. Right. Um, <laughs> I didn't say always. <clears throat> No, but it's interesting because it does bring up the whole thing about spoken language as opposed to yeah. a conversational language as opposed to... A, also, yeah. men have, are inclined to have better diction than women in general because they sing more in their... Ah, women are very good at consonants. <laughs> men, men, speak, men sing more, at least baritones, in their spoken register. Mm -hmm. uh, in the recent long public love letters to you, specifically in the New York Review and by Frank Rich in the Times last week, the terrible photo is everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a, a wag down at Music Theater International, which is the leasing organization for all musicals, put that picture up on the bulletin board with a caption underneath, we'll compose for food. <laughs> In these interviews, there's absolutely no mention of your, your relation to classical music. Yet I've heard you say that Ravel, for one, has deeply influenced you, and heard you evoke the great mezzo Jenny Terrell, whose name also ends with E-L, 
as the ideal interpreter of certain of your songs, or what would have been the ideal interpreter. Also, Aaron Copeland is quoted in a recent biography as loving Sunday in the Park and a little night music, but not Sweeney Todd. You met him only once. Did, did he say he didn't like Sweeney Todd? Yeah, I'm sorry to tell you that. No, no, I didn't know that, really. Did he say why? I'm curious, why? He thought, I'm, I'm quoting Meryl, not Meryl Streep, no, Meryl no. Seacrest. Uh, oh. No, I'm not. I'm quoting Jonathan Pollock, who wrote the book on Aaron Copeland. He didn't think, Howard Pollock, sorry. He didn't think that it was, uh, appropriate is not the word, but, but appropriate for uh, opera. I think it shocked him. Aaron, as if, you, if, you, if you stop to think about it, all of his programmatic or vocal music or theatrical music was about children in one way or another. Yeah. And Sweeney Todd ain't. But you, 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 except dead ones. You, 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 you met him only once. I'm, 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 I, I think I met him up at Leonard Bernstein's at a party. I never met him one-on-one. The book on said one. that you did yeah. once. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Would you write a book or a lyric for somebody else, like me, if I asked you to? Uh, the answer is uh, 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 embarrassingly simple. I find lyric writing too hard to do to do it for somebody else. It's just it's, uh, it's something I do because I have to rather than something I want to do. So, what about I, but I could. I you could, could? I will could. you? You're, you're a witness to this. Because uh, I would love it. But. We'll, we'll go into it later. Uh, I still have in my head a catchy motif from Stavisky from 25 years ago. Oh, oh that one? No, oh, yeah. I thought it was a slow one. No, it's a fast one. It's the movie for which, for which you wrote the score 25 years ago. How much other music without words have you done? Oh, well, uh, professionally, so to speak, meaning stuff I got paid for. Uh, I did some music for the movie Reds. And, oh, what, uh, yeah, right. and I did some background music for some plays, and I've written a couple of so-called concert pieces on my own when I, right out, when I got out of college, violin piece and a two piano piece, but I haven't written very much. If you were commissioned today for a, a generous commission by, say, a major orchestra or chamber orchestra, would you accept it? No, I, I, I have been uh, approached a number of times and I've said no, because I really am only interested in telling stories. In a, in a proscenium arch or thrust stage, uh, <laughs> um, but in a theater. I really am interested in theater work. You did Dick Tracy too. Was there none? There was some sing songs. No, there were just songs. Five songs. Can I tell my Madonna story? If I, I haven't heard it, so I'd be happy to hear um, it. In truth, I have mixed feelings about Mad I love Madonna, actually, especially because of this. In, in Truth or Dare, <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> there's a scene where she sits down in front of her dressing room at her table and picks up a book to read, and the book is My Paris Diary. And uh, it, so it's, I think that's the summit of my glory, and it's downhill all the way from now on. <laughs> I didn't believe... Uh, uh, what, do you, what do you suppose she was trying to find? It, <laughs> I, uh, first of all, I didn't believe it, so I made people take Polaroids of this, and it's true. <clears throat> and... Uh, it was her director uh, uh, with an Armenian name uh -huh. who was interested in the book, so he had her do that. But if I ever meet her, which I won't, uh, or maybe I will, uh, that's our six degrees of separation. <laughs> but uh, my, my question is, what's Madonna really like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I only had the one experience with her, but I can tell you something interesting. Um, when we recorded the songs, she did something I've never known another singer to do. She would not sing, uh, sing uh, and this is when she was singing her solos, when she was doing the duets with Mandy. She would, she would be out in the studio, but when she sang her solos, she sang them in the control room. She wanted to be attached almost umbilically by wire to the engineer. And so, uh, you have to think, she's got a microphone, open microphone, in a control room. You can't make any noise whatsoever. The whole point, of course, of a studio is that it's a controlled silence so, so that the orchestra, the singer, uh, can perform without any uh, oral distractions or scratches or whatever. And, but she insisted on singing in the control room with the lights dimmed to almost, well, certainly less than half. So the whole thing was kind of womb-like feeling. 
and she was standing right next to the engineer. The microphone was open in front of her. I was sitting there, you know, ordinarily I sit with a pad and take notes on things I want, you know, the, the singer to do on the second take. But I realized that the sound of the pencil on the paper, no matter how lightly I wrote, would probably kill the recording. So I had to keep thinking, all right, wait, I got to remember, it's a D flat, not a D, right? Remember? It's, a, no, it's, a, it's, it's a D, not A. Okay, D flat, D. The A. No, uh, the third. Uh, try. Uh, no, I want a faster tempo. D flat. The faster tempo. D flat. The faster tempo. Don't pause. D flat. The faster tempo. Don't pause. <laughs> and then I found out she would only do two takes. She. She. Um, unlike Barbara Streisand, with whom I've also worked, Barbara Streisand likes to do 103 takes and then select note one from take six and all. <laughs> Madonna, Madonna doesn't want, she doesn't want to be bothered, she wants to do it, and uh, uh, she, I don't think she even claims that it's about spontaneity, she just gets irritated and bored. Even choosing between two different takes, sections, I could see her getting increasingly irritated, and um, uh, she has no patience. Barbara has nothing but patience. Very was, interesting. Was the orchestra, was it over a pre-recorded? Yeah, over pre-recorded. Pre pre yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you agree with this, that all music writing, all of it, whether it's a sonata for timpani, uh, a piece for electronic instruments, uh, or a piano piece, but all music is essentially a sung expression. Yeah. And uh, it's the singer within us that is trying to get out with or without words. Yeah. And so I, and that's, that's how I choose these words and then set them to music, as I said earlier in as comprehensible a way as possible. I don't want to, I, I want to heighten the poetry. I don't want to broaden it the way Boulez does or the way Gregorian chant does with taking the word like Deo that will go on for several minutes and if you come in late you don't know what the word is if you're not a Catholic. Uh, I want to take the poet, poetry and simply heighten it. I think a singer can understand that too, you taking taking a pre-existing pre text and making it more than real life. Do you think there are poems that can't be heightened by music? Not by my music. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mean to be, to be facetious. They're, they're, uh, for example, the poems of Robert Lowell, the poems of Marianne Moore have been set, set by very, very good composers, but it's not my... Uh, I don't know quite what they're talking about. I don't know what any poet's talking about if they, because it's poetry, it's not prose, and music, in a sense, explains what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. th so there are certain great poets that aren't my cup of tea and others that are perhaps less great. I don't think that the, the truism that a, the less good a poet is, the better music, I think that's a fallacy, yeah. and, I, and I don't like to hear it. Have you ever said a poem that you didn't understand what the poet was getting at? Yeah, and sometimes after I've said it to music, I know, what what the mu I know what it's about according to what I want it to be about. Have you ever said Wallace Stevens? I have, yeah. I did a whole series called Last Poems of Wallace Stevens for cello, voice, and piano, which is about 25 minutes. Mm. And although I don't know what they're about in any kind of practical way, That's I feel I them. Because I love his poems and I don't understand a word. <laughs> well, it's like Gertrude Stein. I don't understand her, but she's, uh, and I've said her, mm -hmm. but it's so much fun rhythmically, and it's so, and you, uh, the less you understand, the more you can take little chances here and there. Have, are you gonna do some Wallace Stevens? No, 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 it's just, I really, I've always been curious as to why you choose the poems you choose. I've done almost everybody you can yeah. think of, and like two, perhaps 250, and not always poets. I've done the prose of Colette, for example, in English with my own translation, mm. or the prose of Julian Green, or the prose of, uh, or biblical prose, if you will, mm. and although I'm a, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, I do believe in belief, and I believe in other people's convictions. A lot of lousy poetry has been written in the name of the Lord, but so is a lot of good, good poetry. And some of my vast amount of choral music has been for church set settings of the Psalms, for example, and, and from extracts from the New, New Testament. Not because I believe what they're saying, but because I believe in the impulse that makes them be said. And, 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 and have, have you had no temptation to write any more operas? I think I only know that Miss Julie and uh, 
the robbers. Tomorrow I'm having lunch with uh, Paul Kellogg. Is he here? Uh, to talk about... He's coming to my house. I don't know quite what to give him. But <laughs> and the idea will be... He, he runs, as you may know, the City Opera, and I'll want him, A, to revive Miss Julie, B, maybe to commission a curtain raiser, but I don't know that I have a whole big, fat opera in me. Well, I was just wondering what your hesitation was. Did you have a bad experience? Or, or... No, but I don't know that I'm an opera composer as much as I am a composer of songs, yeah. and God, an opera is not no. a big bunch of songs. And a song recital is not an opera in miniature. And there are a lot of people, Minotti is one, who can't really write songs, or, or Verdi, for that matter. Bizet did a pretty good job of writing Bizet songs did and it, making an opera. And so have other, so did Poulenc. Yeah. But yes. other people who write songs, Foray was not really an opera composer. It's, and I think I'm a song composer. But I, someone asked me very nice, I'd write another opera. Do you, a, if you did the libretto. Oh. Or, or B, if I could choose a, a round, because I can't do my own. You have become part of the collective unconscious, which means that, at their best, your songs are memorable because the words and music are inextricable, like those of Cole Porter or Gilbert and Sullivan. You're terrific at rapid songs, sometimes violent and rhythmic and pattery, as well as at slow songs, sometimes wistful and ironic and tragic. A hard act to follow. Dare I ask the tragic and ironic and wistful question, What's next? <laughs> well, again, as most everybody in the audience knows, I've been working for a while with John Wyman on a show called Wise Guys, and we had a workshop of it late last year, which turned out not well. Uh, it was not the workshop we hoped it would be. So we, are, uh, we now have a new director, namely Hal Prince, and um, we're going ahead. <laughs> And we're doing our, I hope, final rewrite on it. And um, we hope to do it next season. What about rewrites on, say, Passion or, or Assassins? Not rewrites, no. but re revivals. Oh, well, the revivals. Um, <laughs> I thought I was getting a little indirect criticism there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, there are no, there are no particular plans. There will be, I th there will be probably a revival of Follies next year. And, uh, but of Assassins and Passions, which have a lot of good music in it, for example, if, if Harbison were to not rewrite, but rearrange some of the uh, Great Gatsby thing, it would be a, a more solid opera. Could that, without changing a note of the music, apply to either of these? No, I, li I like the, both those pieces very much the way they are right now. I think they're the right... <laughs> we, um, it was, there was one song that, uh, because we thought that it would transfer from its off-Broadway run to another off-Broadway house, or conceivably even to on-Broadway, there was one song I wanted to write, but I didn't get time to write there. And then, of course, it did not transfer. So I wrote it for the uh, London production. So there's one extra song that's... In, that's uh, that's in the piece, but now it's the shape we want. I mean, that's what, and passion is just, it's a, you know, it'll get done or it won't. Can you set the scene for the next group of songs? Sure, what's first? Uh, blah, 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 blah. I left uh, poems, I remember sky and so many people. Okay. Uh, poems is from Pacific Overtures. Uh, two young Japanese men are taking a long walking journey and they hardly know each other. One has been in America for a while and has just returned to Japan where he's almost been killed but his life has been saved by this minor samurai. Uh, and so uh, the minor samurai is going home to see his wife and, he, and the, uh, the young sailor from America, Japanese sailor, uh, uh, accompanies him. And the young samurai suggests that to pass the time on this long journey, <clears throat> they compose poems. Uh, and so they do, they compose little alternate haiku-like poems. Uh, and uh, that's that song. And, um, and it takes, the song takes the course of the whole journey. So time passes during it. And their friendship grows until by the time they get back <coughs> to, the wife's, to, to the samurai's house, they become good friends. Uh, the next one's I Remember Sky. It's from a TV musical uh, I wrote with Jim Goldman 
called Evening Primrose, and it's about a, a group of people who live, it's based on a John Collier story, a group of people who live in an apartment store and only come out at night because they hide during the day and their lives are entirely circumscribed by the department store. And they're usually people who've gotten um, tired of the world or disillusioned or gone through a terrible financial crash. A lot of them for, are from specific financial crash. And uh, they're joined by a young poet who wants to hide from the world. And they have a servant, and the servant girl, who's only about 17 or 18, is an accident. She was left in the hat department when she was six years old by her mother, and the, and the, the, the night people took her and have brought her up. So she's grown up since she was six years old entirely in the department store, so that all her points of reference about the world are uh, in terms of things you find in a department store. And So Many People is a song from Saturday Night, uh, which is just a love song. And I think it's uh, sung by two young people.